Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your imagination. Vampire. Perhaps in the safety of your home, the word means little to you. Oh, you've heard of vampires, of course. But do you believe that they exist? Not you. Well, all I can say is, Minna Harker didn't believe either. Our mystery drama, Dracula, was specially adapted from the story by Bram Stoker for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now, another story of the ball and chain, as Kellogg's Special K presents The Library. Welcome to the public library. May I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to check out... Shh. Uh, I'd like to check out Famous Laundromats of the World by Audrey Schnorbart. Sir, excuse me, but isn't that ball and chain you're wearing just like the ones they use in the Kellogg's Special K commercial? Uh, this ball and chain? Shh. Yes, that one. How are you going to get rid of it? Well, you know, lots of good exercises. And by eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. Don't you have to watch your calories? Yes, and the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories. Less than 240 calories? Right. A one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's really tasty, and it's going to help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'd say it's (laughs) long overdue, get it? (laughs) Your happy ending could begin with the Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. There's a very special deal going on at all offices of Suburban Savings throughout North Jersey. It's called Suburban Special Interest Deal, and you'll be especially interested in the savings you get. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban Limited's issue 750 savings certificate. And Suburban guarantees it for from 4 to 10 years. Minimum deposit, $2,500. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is subject to a substantial penalty. Suburban compounds interest continuously from day of deposit, paid quarterly. So you not only get interest on your savings, you get interest on the interest. And Suburban offers you the highest interest rate allowed by law. Here's your chance to get a great savings. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Why not deal yourself into Suburban Savings Special Interest Deal in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. in its purest form, lies ahead for us. I would be remiss if I didn't warn you that if your nerves are not strong, it might be better for you not to listen. No, really now. Be warned. Because as Minna Harker tells us in the diary she kept, there awaits you... An experience so loathsome, so horrifying, that I can hardly bring myself to write of it. If I'd known what lay ahead for me when I went to visit my dearest and closest friend, Lucy Wistenra, at Hillingham, I could not have brought myself to go, much as I loved her. Looking back now, I realize I had plenty of warning, but I paid no attention. For example, as I drove to the Wistenra estate through that lonely, isolated country and heard the wolves howling in the distance, it occurred to me that it was strange to hear wolves in this part of the country. As strange as the huge bat that flew alongside my car. I mentioned this to John, Dr. John Seward, Lucy's fiancé, as we sat having a drink in the living room. It's strange, Minna. I've, I've seen that bat myself. The thing must have a wing spread of at least four feet. I haven't the faintest idea where it came from, or the wolves, either. Even Lucy's letter seemed kind of strange to me, John. What is the matter with her? Oh, I don't know. I'm completely baffled. I've had two other doctors look at her colleagues of mine, and they can't figure it out. I'm desperate, Minna. I'm so desperate, I've called in my old friend and teacher, Professor Van Helsing. Van Helsing? Yes, he's one of the finest diagnosticians in the world, John. Yes, he'll be here from Amsterdam in a day or two. Amsterdam, Holland? Yeah. All the way from Amsterdam. Oh, John, you must be desperate. Lucy is dying, Minna. I'll do anything I can to save her. We, we must find a way to stop her from losing blood. 
losing blood. Well, it's this constant loss of blood that's killing her. Transfusions help for a time, but only a short time, and each transfusion is less effective. John, when can I see her? Oh, she's sleeping now. Her mother's with her, watching her. We take turns. As soon as Mrs. Westenra lets us know she's awake... Oh, listen, those wolves, they're at it again. John, hasn't anyone looked into this wolf thing? How they suddenly come to be in this part of the country? Well, according to the paper, the town police have looked into it. Well, that's peculiar, too. What? Well, they haven't been able to spot one single wolf. Oh, excuse me, we have a visitor. Oh, uh, come in, Count, come in. Thank you, Doctor. I'm on my way to town. I have a dinner engagement, and I thought I would stop to ask after Miss Westenra. Oh, she's no better, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, can you stay for a drink? Well, I... I'd like you to meet a friend of Lucy's who'll be staying with us for a while. Oh, in that case, of course. Uh, Minna, this is Count Dracula, our new neighbor. Count Miss Minna Harker. How do you do? How do you do, Count... Dracula? Yes, but do not hold it against me, Miss Harker. I cannot help being of the blood royal. Well, well, why don't you two get acquainted while I go up and see if Lucy's awake yet? I shall do my best to entertain this charming young lady. I won't be a minute. You're a long way from home, Count. A very long way, Miss Harker. Is it, may I ask what brought you here? Business. Business? Good heavens, what kind of business could you have in this part of the country? I mean, it's so isolated. <laughs> True, it does present difficulties, but uh, I like living in the country. Oh, you must. Oh, forgive me, I'm forgetting my manners. Would you like a drink? I uh, thank you. A scotch or bourbon? Is there perhaps some wine? Red wine. Now, let me see. I'm not very familiar with the supply here. It's... Ah, here we are. Here's a bottle of burgundy. Ah, that glass of that will be... Oh. Miss Arca, what's wrong? I, I... Uh... What is it? Uh, it's the bottle, I'm afraid. Afraid it slipped. Uh, it slipped. That's all. Oh, my, I'm afraid I cut my hand. <gasps> no, no, don't, can't, don't be upset. It's only a slight cut. No. See? No. Lucy, wake and we can. Can't. What's wrong? <laughs> Minna, oh, I, your hand. I must leave at once, Doctor. Sorry, I cannot stay. Something I just remembered. No, no, no. It's all right. I will see myself. Oh. What in the world? But can't. Minna, what happened? I dropped the bottle of wine and cut my hand. Yes, I, I, I see you did, but... I uh... dropped the bottle because... Because I couldn't see him in the mirror. Couldn't see? Who, what mirror? This mirror over the table. It reflects the whole room. Well, of course it does, but... John, John, I picked up the bottle to pour Count Dracula a drink, and I yes. looked into the mirror, and he was standing where you are now, and I couldn't see him in the mirror. What? He was there where you're standing, but he wasn't reflected in the glass. Minna, you're not making sense. And you're trembling. John, I'm scared. Of what? How can you ask? I look in the mirror and didn't see someone who should have been reflected in it. There's something going wrong with my eyes or my brain, John. Oh, what? Minna, easy, easy. I don't want another patient on my hands. But, John, I... An optical illusion, something like that. Our eyes play tricks on us sometimes. Now, come on. Let's get a bandage for that cut, and then we'll go up and see Lucy. I believe, John, it must have been. It had to be a trick my eyes had played. What else? Well, we got a bandage for the cut on my hand, and then John took me to Lucy's room. I can't find words to describe the shock I felt when I saw her. She was white as new-fallen snow, and so thin. She almost seemed transparent. She's dying. That was my first thought. She's dying, and nothing can save her. And I know she read the thoughts in my face. I could see the sudden fear in her eyes. I am dying. Oh, you mustn't even think that, Lucy. You do. I? It was in your face when you looked at me. I read your thoughts. She's dying, you thought. And nothing can save her. I am. And nothing can save me. Oh, John can save you. And he will. He hasn't so far. Oh, you mustn't despair, Lucy. Despair, Minna? I don't have the strength to despair. You better go now, Minna. Go? 
Lucy, dear, I haven't seen you in nearly a year. We haven't even started to tell each other everything that's happened. Later. Uh, not, not now. I'm tired. I want to sleep. Oh, well, in that case, I'll come back later. No, uh, not till tomorrow. All right, whatever you say. But I'll just look in on you later. No, I... Lucy. You mustn't, you mustn't. All right, all right, then. But stop upsetting oh, yourself. Go, go, quickly. Oh, good Lord. At the window. It's, it's nothing. Go, Minna, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's that bat. That huge bat that followed my car. Oh, oh, I beg of you. Lucy, the thing is trying to get in. Look, it's clawing at the window. Is that locked? Is that window yes, locked? Yes, it's locked. But locks oh. are useless against Count Dracula. Oh, good Lord. Mirrors do not reflect my image, Miss Harker. Nor do locks keep me out. You, you, you were that bat. As the wolves you hear are not wolves, but like... Myself, vampires. Vampires? The dead who live by night. The dead, undead. No, this this can't be happening. It's a dream. It's a nightmare. That's what it will seem like when you wake up. Huh? Yes, you're going to sleep now. And yet not sleep. Huh? You'll remember all you've seen here, but when you wake in, it will seem like a dream. A dream you'll tell no one, not even Professor Van Helsing. Because you will not want to look foolish. You'll be ashamed to tell it for fear he will think you're a silly young woman. <sighs> Enough. <sighs> sleep. Did I sleep? Did I dream? No. My sleep was a hypnotic trance into which he had placed me. And what I dreamed was reality. There in the moonlight that streamed through the window, I saw Dracula raise his arms and call. Lucy. Lucy, my dearest love, come to me. Come, my darling. I... I... I can't. Too weak, my lover. I'm too weak. Then I shall come to you. Embrace you. Kiss you. And now the strangest thing of all happened to me. As I watched what then took place, my love for my friend Lucy, my fears for her, made me feel as she must have felt so poignantly, so deeply that... Yes... I became Lucy. I watched Dracula as he approached my bed. There was a deliberate voluptuousness in him which I found both thrilling and repulsive. Lower and lower went his head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat. I could feel the hot breath on my neck then the skin of my throat began to tingle. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of his lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat, and then two hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy, and I waited. I waited with a beating heart. And then horror overcame me. And I sank into unconsciousness. I promise that the horror you have just experienced is nothing compared to what is to come. Think twice before you return with me shortly with Act Two. Hi. Goldilocks, Ms. Goldilocks, if you please, and I'm a professional taste tester. Here at my taste test laboratory, that's TTL for short, <laughs> I taste test everything from porridge to diet drinks. Actually, there's not that much taste testing in porridge these days. There used to be, 
Once upon a time. I mean, that's how this Miz got into the biz. <laughs> but lately, it's been diet drinks. I mean, with so many diet drinks going sugar-free, I've been really busy conducting taste tests. A rather unbearable assignment, to be sure. But then I discovered sugar-free diet 7-Up. Fresh, natural, delicious. My only problem is that sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that it broke my Goldilocks diet drink taste meter well, Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up certainly has my seal of approval. This one's just right. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors, and your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners... ShopRite is featuring whole grade-A frying chickens, just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens, up to 4 pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice beef rib steaks, $1.19 a pound. ShopRite pranks, 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station, your station for Mystery Theater. I thought it must have been a dream, a nightmare, for nothing so vile and revolting could be real. But though I tried during the next day or two to persuade myself it was only a dream, there were signs, warnings all about me that told me I was lying to myself. There was the nightly howling of the wolves, the screeching of that huge bat around the house. And yes, the scarf that Lucy kept wrapped round her throat. It's such a hot afternoon, how can you bear to wear that scarf around your throat? Hot? I feel cold. But, Lucy, you're perspiring. Your forehead is damp. All I want to do is sleep. I'm so tired. I'm so deathly tired. I'll leave you for a while, then. I'll look in on you later to make sure you're all right. Oh. Sleep well. Minna? Yes, dear? If I'm asleep when you come back, promise me you won't remove this scarf from around my throat. Very well. You won't even... Touch it. Promise? I promise. Later that afternoon, toward evening, Professor Van Helsing arrived from Holland. When John introduced me to him, he stared at me suddenly and hard, his eyes boring into me from behind his thick lens glasses. You are frightened, Miss Harker? Why? Frightened. Maybe she hasn't recovered from that optical illusion the other night. Optical illusion? Yes, you see that mirror over the table there? Yes. Well, we had a visitor, Count Dracula, a new neighbor, Carfax, a few miles from here, and Minna had the illusion that she couldn't see his reflection in the mirror. My eyes must have played a trick on me, Professor. Yes. Uh, this Count Dracula, John, he's uh, new here, you say? Yes, he arrived from Hungary about six weeks ago. I see. Take me to see her fiancé, John. Oh, uh, she's sleeping, Lucy. Oh, sleeping. We'd right better now. wake her up. Uh, what is it? You seem suddenly concerned. I am. Take me to Lucy at once. Wake her, John. All right. Gently. Very gently. Lucy? Lucy, dear. Come on, wake up. Uh, here, here, here. Let me. Pulse weak, very weak. Eyes. Oh, she's not asleep. She's in a coma. What is her blood type? Oh, so is mine. Prepare for a transfusion, John. I will be the donor. And hurry, man, hurry. Yes, yes, of course. Meanwhile, I shall have a look under this scarf. No, no, she didn't want the scarf removed. Well, I'm sure she didn't, Miss Harker, but we're going to remove it. Aha. Uh -huh. As I thought. What? What is it? Yes, Professor, what? Look. Look. There are two... two little holes. Wounds. As if she'd been bitten by a large snake. No. 
Not a snake. Well, what then? What? We must be quick with the transfusion. Very quick. And pray God, pray God, both of you, that I have not arrived too late. But he was too late. The transfusion revived Lucy a little when we made her as comfortable as we could. The three of us, Professor Van Helsing, John and I, went back down to the living room. And it was here that Professor Van Helsing told us the truth. The truth that made John Seward cry out. Vampire? You say we are dealing with a vampire? Professor, have you gone out of your mind? My dear John, I don't blame you. Blame me? I should hope not. You ask me to believe me, a doctor, a man of medical science? <laughs> science? Uh, there's more to this world than science. But, Professor, a vampire? I can't believe that there's a vampire. I tell you that witches exist. That warlocks exist. That vampires exist. And we are dealing with one here. But if, if what you say is true... It is, it is. Ask her. Ask Miss Harker. Me? Uh, you had an experience in this house that you are concealing. You choose to think it was a dream. Well, when did it happen, child? Last night? No. The night before. Where? In Lucy's bedroom. Minna, what happened? I... I dreamed... No, it was no dream. All right, then. I saw... Oh, heaven, protect me. I saw... You needn't tell me. No need to put you through that. I would if I didn't know who our vampire is. But I do know. Who? The man whose reflection she could not see in that mirror. Your new neighbor, Count Dracula. I don't believe you. I cannot believe you. If you can't believe me, at least trust me. Oh, I'll answer that. Wait. Yes, Professor. Uh, if that should be Count Dracula, you did say that he calls about this time each evening, John. Yes, Say nothing, do nothing to give away the fact that we are unto him. Oh, this is nonsense, sheer do nonsense. Do as I tell you. You may answer the door now, Miss Harker. Yes. Good evening, Miss Harker. Count Dracula? Uh, come in. And how is Miss West Enra today? Not too well, I'm afraid. She had to have another transfusion. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, John. Very sorry to hear that. Thank you, Count. I do not believe I have met this gentleman. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, you, you haven't. Uh, let me present my old friend and teacher, Professor Abraham Van Helsing. Uh, Professor, this is Count Dracula. How do you do, Professor? How do you do, Count? But I wished only to inquire about your fiancée, John. I'm sorry indeed to hear she is no better. If there is anything I can do... Thank you. Meeting you, Professor, has been... Pleasure. Good night. Oh, um, Count. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Westenra keeps asking me to do this, and I keep forgetting. Uh, there is a custom in the Westenra family to ask visitors to sign the visitor's book. Ah, charming old world custom. Uh, it's right here, if you'll just wait a second. I'll, I'll get it, and um, then you can sign it. <clears throat> is something wrong? It, it's a Bible. Well, well, yes. Why do you back away from me? Or are you backing away from the book? The holy book? I must go. No, no, you'll stay and face this book. You know. You know. John, you fool. You shouldn't have done this. I had to. I had to have proof. I will make you pay for this. You shall pay. Oh, no. Not now. Now that I have found out what you are. Oh, John, John. You think because you discovered my secret you can stop me? Fool. You only delivered yourself into my hands. I meant to make Lucy one of mine, and that was all. But now you shall become mine, and you... Not I. Yes, and you... No, I beg you. I shall have you all, but first... Lucy, I shall take her. Take her. Now. She's mine. She's no longer of this world, but of mine. I leave you. Look! Look, he turned into a bat! The bat! And he flew right through the wall. John! Oh! John, why did you do this? Why, after I warned you. I, I had to know one way or the other. I had to know. There's only one way to finish a vampire. Oh, the first thing you must do is find out where he sleeps during the day. <coughs> Lucy! <coughs> Professor, quickly. <coughs> Professor! There is no hurry now. And he said he meant to make her his own. 
he had already done so. It was true. Lucy was dead. We went to her bedroom and found her. Dead. I felt as if I'd been stabbed to the heart. We buried her, my dearest friend, in the West End Revolt at Hillingham Cemetery, not far from town. Lucy is gone. Dead? No. No, not dead. Not dead, Professor. She has become the undead. She has become a vampire. What are you saying? John, listen to me. Believe in me. You didn't believe before. Believe now. Yes, yes, yes. I believe you. Go on, go on. John, you, you, you feel you've been through hell. I must tell you that you have been through only the anteroom to hell. What do you mean? Now, listen to me. Listen carefully. There is only one way in which a vampire can find peace, can be changed from the undead to the dead. What you must do, terrible as it will be, will release her soul from the horrifying bondage in which it finds itself. Her soul and Dracula's. Dracula's? Do you think a vampire wants to be a vampire? Oh, no, no. A vampire's soul is chained, pinioned, held mercilessly to this earth by Satan himself. And we, we who believe in God, are the only ones who can free them. It is our duty to destroy them. Well, then let's destroy them. We shall... If you have the nerve to do what, what must be done. I have the nerve. Professor, you frighten me. I mean to, in order to prepare you. But no matter how well I prepare you, when it comes to doing what must be done, your, your sanity could snap like, like that. So first I will ask you both to take as much time as you need to, to think, to ask yourselves, how much did you... Do you really love Lucy Westenra? And be sure, be positive beyond all doubt that your love for her is greater than the hell that lies ahead. Lies ahead for you and you this very night. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. When you drink beer, do you tilt the glass for long, hearty swallows? Or just tip it and sip it? Well, sipping's the thing for wine. But Budweiser beer is a hearty drink, brewed for zest and character. The best way to enjoy Bud is to drink it. Not chug a lug, just man sized beer drinker swallows. That's when that famous Budweiser taste, smoothness, and drinkability really come through. Smoothness and drinkability that come only from natural carbonation and exclusive beechwood aging. Smoothness and drinkability, too good for any half-hearted sipping. So drink up. You'll see that brewing beer right does make a difference. And that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser Bush, St. Louis. I thought I knew what horror was until I read it. I changed my mind. You will, too. I'm ready, Professor. I knew you would be, John. We'll wait now for Miss Harker. No, no, there's no need to wait. I love Lucy enough. More than enough. She was my dearest friend. Is your dearest friend. For she is not yet dead. She is as yet the dead undead. It's nearly sundown. Let us go to the cemetery at once. The cemetery? It will be dark by the time we get there. She will have left her coffin. Left it? Well, like Count Dracula, she cannot go on living, or let me say, being the undead without drinking human blood. Now, to find it, she must, of course, leave her coffin. The instant the sun goes down tonight, she will be on the prowl for little children. Children? Yes, children are innocent, gullible, naive. Make easier victims. And the inexperienced vampire must uh, practice. Yes, she, she will be seeking children. Oh, it's revolting. <laughs> revolting? Well, that is only a word to you at the moment. In a short time, it will be reality. Uh, do you really think you can bear what, what is to come? I can't. 
I must. Good. Uh, I have uh, preparations to make. So do you, the two of you. Dress warmly. Warmly? But it's hot out. Child, there is no chill like a graveyard chill. We drove to Hillingham Cemetery in John's car. I'd never been in a cemetery at night. How many people have? I found it a very unsettling experience, to say the least. It was a moonlit night, the moonlight spilling like milk over the gravestones, which in turn threw long, black shadows. An owl hooted, and dogs barked. Or I couldn't help thinking, were they wolves? And then we reached the West End Revolt, the vault where we'd put Lucy's coffin that afternoon. Now what do we do, Professor? We go into the vault. Why? Uh, and how? I have the key to the vault. How did you get it? I asked the undertaker for it, or rather told him to give it to me. He assumed I was a member of the family. Well, you need not come with me. Not now. But why shouldn't we come? I wish to save you as much shock as I can. She will not be there in the coffin. It will be a shock for you to find it empty. Now, on the other hand, it will be less a shock than what is to follow. Yes, it will prepare you. Come, then. Now, I shall open the coffin now. If she... if she isn't in it, how could she have got out? I could tell you, but it is better that you see for yourself later... Now, this won't take long. I need only unscrew the top part. There. Now to lift off the top of the lid. Yes. Empty. She's gone. Where? Gone where? In God's name, where? In search of the life-giving blood, John. In search of a small child. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. John. Yes? Come, we go outside the vault. <laughs> now to lock the door. Now ah, that's most important. And now, what I must do will take a little time. Yes, make yourselves as comfortable as you can. <laughs> make ourselves comfortable. Professor, what must you do? Well, I have here a paste made of garlic, flour, and water. Uh, I must seal off every crevice with it. Seal all around the door so Lucy cannot get back into the vault, into her coffin. She could? Through the crevices, yes. How do you think she got out of the coffin? I can't believe... Yes, yes, yes. It is unbelievable. But it is so. Now, forgive me. I must get to work. I can't express in words how fresh and clean the night air seemed when we came out of the tomb. How sweet to breathe the fresh air that held no taint of death or decay. John was silent, and so was I. As for Professor Van Helsing, he was very busy sealing the door. Ten o'clock. I hope both of you took my advice, dressed warmly. We have a long wait ahead of us. How much longer, Professor? I'm chilled to the bone. Uh, everything depends on how long it takes her to find a small child. Uh, nearly two o'clock. It's been gone several hours. Soon now, I think... Shh. What? She comes. Where? See there? Amidst the headstones? Yes, a woman. Dressed in white. Lucy. Shh. Shh. Make no move, no noise. You see, she is carrying something in her arms. A child. I feel sick. Control yourself. Ah, there. Yes, she's coming toward the vault. See, she draws back. Uh, The mixture I used repels her. Why are we doing this? Why are you keeping her out of the vault, her coffin? Because I hope... Ah, yes. Yes, she is leaving, hurrying away from among the headstones. Come, we, we must follow. Follow? Follow where? To Dracula, I hope. Unless I'm mistaken, she's going 
to him for help. Uh, hurry, hurry. We must keep her Go in on. sight. No, wait. What is it? She is heading for, for that tomb. Dracula must be there. Good. Now watch. Huh? See, now she's putting the child down. On the ground. And now... Where? Where is she? Where is she? She's vanished. She simply slipped into the tomb through the crevice around the door. Oh, wait here. Yes. What's he doing? He's picking up the child, I think. Yes. See, he, he's coming back now. Here, Miss Harker. You take the child. Keep it warm. Oh, this poor thing. Poor little thing. Look, it doesn't move. It doesn't make a sound. It's lifeless. No. No, only in a trance. It will recover. But remember, when I ask you to do what must be done, remember that we have saved not only this child, but God knows how many others. I'll remember. Good. And now we will return to her tomb and wait till dawn. Till dawn? She will return to the tomb then. She has no choice. Dracula cannot help her. She must sleep in her own coffin before daybreak. And how do you feel, Miss Harker? I'm all right. Thank you. John. Oh, I'm okay. It's almost dawn. Why doesn't she come? Soon, soon now. Uh, how's the child? Still asleep, if it is only sleep. It is, it is. It will not come to its senses until daybreak. Now, prepare yourselves for... In a very short time, now Lucy should... Ah, there, there. Yes, she's, she's coming. And this time she'll be able to enter the tomb. Because you've removed the garlic mixture. This time I want her to enter the tomb and her coffin. It will be there that you will do what... What must be done? Oh, there, there she is. Oh, heaven help me. She is as beautiful as she always was. Now hold on to yourself. She, she isn't dead. She can't be dead. Lucy! Lucy, my darling! John! No, come back! Lucy! John, my dearest, come to me, John! Come to me! I have never seen anything so horrible. And God save me from ever seeing it again. Lucy's eyes shone with an unholy light, and her face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile as she advanced toward John with outstretched arms. Come to me, dearest. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together in the tomb. Come, my lover. Come. And John suddenly opened wide his arms and started running to her and she to him when Van Helsing rushed forward between them and he raised something he held in his hand up against her face. It was a crucifix. With a cry of rage and <coughs> agony, Lucy flung herself away from John and toward the tomb and she was gone. John? John, are you all right? <laughs> Lord, help me. The Lord help me. And he shall. Come. Into the tomb. It's time. Now, first, let me put the bag I brought over here. And now I will remove the coffin lid again. Professor, is this really Lucy's body or some kind of demon in her shape? Oh. Oh, she's hideous. Yes. Yes, your friend who was so sweet and pure is now a foul thing. But if you can do what you must do, you will see her once again as she was. Whatever it is, we'll do it. This wooden stake I have bought. Yes. This pointed stake, you must drive it through Lucy's heart with this hammer. Oh, no. And when that is done... Cut off her head with this surgical knife. Uh, I, I, I don't, you, I don't. You must do it for her sake, John, for the sake of the woman you loved. All right. Give me the stake and the hammer. John. 
John took the stake in his left hand, the hammer in his right. I saw him tremble as he placed the point of the stake over Lucy's heart, saw the point dig into her white flesh, and then I could see him gather all his strength, all his self-control. He raised the hammer high above his head and looked at Van Helsing. Yes. John struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the opened lips. The body shook and twisted in wild contortions. John never faltered. He struck, and he struck again, driving the stake deeper, deeper. His blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less. The teeth stopped champing, and the thing lay still. It was over. Is that enough, Professor? Enough. I... I think I'm... I think I'm going to... I've got uh, you. There. Now go outside, get some air. No. I... Both of you go. You look faint too, Miss Parker. I must still her head. I, no, her head no. I have... You have done all that can be asked of you. No more. I will sever the head. Now go now, but before you do... Look at your beloved Lucy. For the last time. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing we dreaded. But Lucy, as we had seen her in life, her face as beautiful and pure as it had been then. You will want to know that later on, Professor Van Helsing freed Count Dracula from his earthly bondage. And in so doing, brought his bloody career to an end. Unhappily, I must add that Count Dracula was only one vampire among... uh, How many? I don't know. Hope I never find out. Hope you don't either. I'll be back shortly. Dear Thomas's, your new Thomas's onion English muffins are so delicious, my husband insists on them at every meal. It's embarrassing when we go to a Chinese restaurant. Dear Thomas's, for years I've been buying bagels and bialis with my Sunday Times. Last Sunday I bought the Times and your new Thomas's onion English muffins. Not bad, Thomas's. Dear Thomas's, since serving sandwiches on your new onion English muffins, I've become very popular with the boys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thomas's new onion English muffins. Here, 45, please, and don't spare the horses. Yes, sir. In 1880, when a cab had four legs and took 12 minutes to cross Manhattan, Samuel Bath Thomas was baking bread, every bit as delicious as his original English muffins. Here, 45, and move it. Today, cabs have 300 horses, but still take 12 minutes to cross town. And Thomas's is still baking breads, every bit as delicious as their English muffins. Thomas's protein, whole wheat, and white bread. Thomas's promises. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Paul Hecht, Stefan Schnabel, Michael Wager, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... CBS Radio Network. This is Mary Helen McPhillips. I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at 10.15. I have great fun in store for you. My guest is Henry Pleasance, the famous, very well-known, serious music critic. But tomorrow, he's going to be talking about how great popular singers are and just why they are. And we'll hear little bits of some of their singing. That's tomorrow morning at 10.15. Lewis, 
broadcast in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Nixon got a six-day delay today in his fight against a Watergate subpoena, and a panel of experts said it will present another report on Saturday regarding that now-famous 18-and-a-half-minute gap in one of the crucial White House Watergate tapes. A sweeping subpoena issued against the president by the Watergate special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, had been due this morning, but U.S. District Court Judge John Sirica gave attorneys additional time to file briefs and to set a hearing date after the White House petitioned the court to quash the subpoena. In a brief session with attorneys in the Watergate cover-up case and White House attorneys, Judge Sirica gave them until next Monday to file answers to the White House motion. He set a hearing for next Wednesday. In a similar struggle last fall, you recall, Judge Sirica rejected White House claims of executive privilege. Back then, he ordered the president to turn over several tape recordings of presidential conversations, and he was upheld by the U.S. Court of Appeals here in Washington. But also, as you recall, the president eventually turned over the tapes without appealing the case to the Supreme Court. There were strong indications from both sides this time, however, that the final showdown may come in the high court. Meanwhile, two members of the panel of tape recording experts said that they are going to present their report to Judge Sirica on Saturday. That panel has been studying the cause of the gap, studying it since last November. In its interim report, issued in January, the same panel said that the gap had been caused by a process of erasing and re-recording at least five, possibly nine times. But it did not address itself to whether the erasure and re-recording was deliberate or accidental. Judge Sirica said that the meeting Saturday with Dr. Richard Bolt, a former professor at MIT and a second unnamed member of the panel, would be held in the judge's chambers. The judge said details of the report will not be made public at that time, but that further proceedings in connection with the report will be decided at the meeting. The panel was chosen jointly by the White House and by Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski. After the gap in the tape was made known in a hearing before Judge Sirica, who recommended that the Watergate grand jury investigate the incident. The gap is in one of nine tapes that were originally subpoenaed by the special prosecutor's office last year. The blank section is at the beginning of a conversation between the president and then White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman, the date June 20th, 1972. That, of course, was just three days after the break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters in the Watergate office building here in the nation's capital. At the White House today, Deputy White House Press Secretary Gerald Warren said that the House Judiciary Committee, which is considering impeachment of the president, got, in Warren's words, the full story of the Watergate issue when the president turned over some 1,200 pages of edited transcripts of taped White House conversations on Tuesday. Warren commented in response to a question about the committee's vote last night to inform the president that it feels he has failed to comply with its subpoena, which had asked for the tapes themselves rather than for the edited transcripts. Warren said that the White House feels the committee members have been given the facts on which they can move ahead. He also stuck by the president's offer to allow committee chairman Peter Rodino, the New Jersey Democrat, and the ranking Republican member, Michigan Republican Representative Edward Hutchinson, but no other committee, no staff members, to listen to the tapes in private and to verify the accuracy of the transcripts. Warren today commented, we feel that we have made a very fair, full, and responsible offer. From sources in the Senate came reports, meanwhile, that Alexander Haig, currently the White House Chief of Staff, today refused to answer questions before the Senate Watergate Committee, saying that he'd been instructed to invoke executive privilege by President Nixon himself. At an executive session of the panel, Haig presented a letter from the president saying, quote, It would be wholly inappropriate for the committee to examine you about your activities as chief of staff or about information that has come to you in that position. The president's letter invoked both executive privilege and attorney-client privilege in ordering Haig not to cooperate with the committee's probe of the Watergate issue. Meanwhile, Vice President Gerald Ford said today that after reading some of the newly released Watergate transcripts, he is, in his words, convinced beyond any doubt that President Nixon is innocent of any wrongdoing. However, Ford said he believes the president could have been a little more forceful in trying to get to the bottom of the Watergate issue a little faster. In a brief meeting with reporters of the Justice Department, Assistant Attorney General Henry Peterson today defended his conduct of the initial Watergate investigation and declared, I am not a whore. The White House edited transcript showed Peterson regularly informing the president about the progress of the investigations, 
sometimes even advising him about ways to deal with top presidential aides who were implicated in the scandal. Peterson today said, I walked through a minefield and came out clean. In another Watergate impeachment development, the Judiciary Committee approved by voice, voice vote live television coverage of its impeachment proceedings so long as it does not interfere with those proceedings. Presidential Counselor Dean Burt said the White House had no objections to live television coverage. However, he repeated the White House view that whatever is done should be handed, spe handled speedily. Burt said in a White House meeting with newsmen, time is becoming critical in this thing. It's not the right thing to continue the proceedings into the autumn election campaigns. Former milk producer lobbyist Bob Lilly is quoted in court papers as saying that his boss told him that campaign donations were pledged to President Nixon in conjunction with the 1971 price support increase. That statement is the first to be attributed to a dairy cooperative official alleging any link between the president's order to raise federal milk price supports in 1971 and the dairyman's promise of up to $2 million in campaign donations. In a White House statement last January, the president specifically denied that he ordered prices increased in return for that campaign money. He did concede that traditional political considerations did play a part in his decision to overrule the Agriculture Department's desire to keep prices steady. The House Judiciary Committee is investigating the milk price matter as part of its impeachment inquiry, and the Watergate Special Prosecution Force is also looking into it. The White House has declined requests for numerous tapes and documents relating to that price support matter. Lilly's statement actually surfaced as part of subpoenaed papers made public in connection with the Justice Department's antitrust suit against the nation's largest dairy farmer cooperative, Associated Milk Producers Incorporated. He was interviewed by former American Bar Association President Edward Wright last December 27th and 28th as part of his investigation into the milk producer's political activities, which he conducted for the co-op's board of directors. A judge delayed today his decision on a motion by defense attorneys in the John Ehrlichman perjury case to move the trial out of Los Angeles because of excess publicity. Superior Court Judge Gordon Ringer ordered a recess until the next mail delivery at the request of defense attorneys who were waiting for newspaper clippings to arrive from San Diego County. The defense team has claimed that the former presidential advisor could get a more fair trial in the San Diego area because publicity there has been more favorable to Ehrlichman. They said the clippings are needed to support that claim. Syrian leaders seem to be confident that when Secretary of State Henry Kissinger arrives there on Friday, he may be carrying a significant Israeli concession that could pave the way for negotiations on separating forces on the Golan Heights. A high-ranking source in Damascus said the talks will be complicated, but we are convinced Washington realizes what is at stake and Kissinger will not come with an empty briefcase. Although the secretary has appealed to both sides for restraint while he tries to work out an agreement, official sources in Damascus say that Syria's president has adopted a Viet Cong-style strategy, a strategy of fighting while negotiating. Diplomats also note a new Syrian desire to cooperate and maybe even compromise, a desire that has been prom promoted by, first, a growing belief that U.S. mediation efforts are sincere, secondly, the, U the lure of U.S. monetary aid and Western technology for a long-hoped-for economic rebirth of Syria, thirdly, President Nixon's foreign aid package that gave Egypt $250 million dollars, also includes provisions for $100 million that could possibly go to Syria. Also, Israeli cabinet changes that have prompted some Syrian hopes that the Israelis may be more amenable than before to Secretary Kissinger's persuasive powers. And finally, the closing gap between Soviet and U.S. efforts in the Middle East. The Soviet Union had encouraged Syrian militancy to counter Kissinger's dominant role in Mideast diplomacy and its waning influence in Egypt, but Kissinger's conciliatory talks with Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko in Geneva have apparently resulted in new U.S.-Soviet pledges to try to work together insofar as the Middle East is concerned. The Senate here today passed and sent to President Nixon a compromise bill which creates a new Federal Energy Office. The bill passed 236 to 9 by the House of Representatives back on Monday. It won in the Senate by a voice vote. Energy-related functions now spread over numerous federal offices. These would be centered in the new agency. 
It would have extensive authority to require information from energy companies and to even issue subpoenas if necessary. President Nixon is expected to formally nominate John Sawhill, now FEO administrator, to head up the new formal agency. The nominee would be subject to Senate confirmation. The bill authorizes $475 million for the agency to operate until June 30th, 1976. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here.